Sophie, so nice to meet you finally. See. How's it going? Yeah, it's good. Busy few weeks, but um, I went to see my parents at the weekend, which these days is an exciting adventure and about as far as I'm allowed to go. <laughs> <laughs> so true. So true. I know it. Um, okay. So you are from Uzbekistan originally? No, I'm British. Oh, you're British. Okay. <laughs> um, and then, so did you live in Uzbekistan? Yeah, I lived in, well, I lived in Central Asia generally from 2008 to 2012. And then I've been working there on and off ever since. And what do you do for work? So I do tourism development and promotion. So currently I work for the World Bank on, as a consultant on their projects. And I also have my own company doing consultancy and, and public relations, mostly for countries in the region. I see. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah. So tell me a little bit. You are coming on the show to represent Uzbekistan. Um, but so, yeah, tell me a little bit about Uzbekistan and just like when you were there, how it was. So I'm Uzbekistan's ambassador for tourism. And I fell in love with Uzbekistan because it was completely not what I was expecting at all. I went to the country for the first time in 2010. And I was actually, I was driving from the UK to Afghanistan on a, a Mongol rally style trip. It wasn't the Mongol rally, but it was that same kind of ludicrous adventure in a, a vehicle that wasn't fit for purpose. And it took weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, and before I got to Uzbekistan, the last kind of civilized place I had been was Moscow. And after that, it was weeks of driving through the back end of beyond, um, nowhere decent to stay, nowhere decent to eat, miles and miles of, of flat step and wondering if I was ever ever going to see like urban life again. <laughs> um, and I arrived in Uzbekistan first in Tashkent and then in Samarkand and I was completely bowled away because it was such a contrast to Kazakhstan and southern Russia which I've been driving through for weeks. It was um, not only the history, but the architecture, the people, it just seemed like a completely different, not only country, but a different world. And all the more surprising, given that it was right next door to, to Kazakhstan, which generally I would say is a bit more famous. People tend to have heard a little bit about Kazakhstan, uh, either because of the airlines or because of hosting the World Fair or because of Borat. Um, but actually I think Uzbekistan has got far more to offer both uh, culturally and as a tourism destination, but also economically and in terms of the way the country is developing, it's a lot more exciting. Um, yeah, explain the, how, the, how the country is developing, that I'm interested in. Um, what do you mean by that, expand upon it? So Uzbekistan was part of the Soviet Union until it became independent in 1991. Um, but for the past 25 or so years, actually not a lot changed. Um, it was still very similar to how it had been in the Soviet period in terms of the planned economy, a uh, very tightly controlled political system and very conservative society. Uzbekistan had a new president in 2016, end of 2016, um, because his predecessor died. And the new president is much more of a reformer. And so what we've seen is that in the last four years, the country has started to open up really, really quickly. Um, there's been a huge amount of, of economic reform of um, investment, uh, of diplomatic changes, the country's looking much more outward, and then practical changes like much more flights. It's now visa-free for 86 nationalities. So whereas before you had to get a letter of invitation, then you had to get a visa, um, and then you'd get there and you'd have to register everywhere you went, and there was a huge amount of bureaucracy that was quite repressive. Now it's, it's basically you get on a flight, you arrive, um, they stamp you into the country and that's it. There's, all of the paperwork has gone. Um, and that makes it much, much easier for travelers, but it's also indicative of the way that the country is, is modernizing and opening up to the rest of the world. Totally, yeah. Um, I did not know that, so that's actually kind of exciting, as if it's a, for Americans to just- It's not it. for Americans yet, so that's one yeah. of the <laughs> all of, uh, European Union and UK, and uh, so 86 countries in total are visa-free. Um, Americans currently can get an e-visa, which is a kind of a, a halfway house, really. Um, so it's, I think it's about $20. You just apply online and okay. it through to your email. So yeah. it's pretty really straightforward. Um, and That's hopefully right. um, in the next sort of year or so, Americans will be visa-free as well. Okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, I get it. Look, America, it's 
crazy. It's a crazy place, especially right now. Um, so maybe hold off on that for a bit. <laughs> um, okay, so well, talking about the how have you been to Uzbekistan or when was the last time you were in Uzbekistan? The last time I was in Uzbekistan was in February, so just before we locked down in the UK. Oh my goodness. And then you just flew back to the UK and like locked down or you came back and didn't know this was all happening? And I came back and I had a couple of other trips. So UK locked down in the middle of March. Um, and so I had about a month between leaving Uzbekistan. I had a few other trips for work and then I, I flew back a couple of days before, before lockdown here. So I went out to Uzbekistan in February to check out the new ski resort because although people think of sort of camels and the Silk Road and uh, the desert, actually Uzbekistan has got some phenomenal skiing and there's a brand new resort called Amisoy which opened this winter. Um, it's run by the guy who used to manage Courchevel in the French Alps and it's um, like a, a multi multi-million dollar uh, resort with cutting edge equipment so it's really very very cool. Um, so I went out to to see that and obviously February is a, a great time for skiing and I loved it because it was such a contrast with everything I've seen and done before in the country. Um, I love the history, I love the culture but I also really like being outdoors and having the opportunity to be in the mountains particularly in the winter when the the climate is so different and there's so few other tourists was really very very exciting for me. So you ski? I ski. Okay. Um, this trip we actually got to do heli skiing as well because What's that? Well. so you fly up to the top of a mountain in a helicopter they drop you off and you ski down so oh yeah 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 oh my god <laughs> way way beyond where the um where the lifts are and most places in europe it's now banned um okay. because of the safety or because of the environmental considerations um i gather it's still possible in in places in the us and in canada but it's generally very expensive um but uzbekistan they've got a, a sort of a balance so they've got all the right equipment and it's safe to do but it's it's nowhere near as expensive as in the US so I think we're going to see a lot of adventure junkies coming to Uzbekistan for, for heli skiing and backcountry skiing next winter. Um, yeah like sign me up want to do that um, probably not a good enough skier to do that I I skied a couple years ago but I bought um, my own snowboarding equipment like yeah. 10 years ago and so I've only snowboarded for the last decade almost. You can snowboard as well. The, um, the yeah, but I'm just not very good. I'm not good enough to jump out of a plane on a <laughs> snowboard, I don't think. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, well, I'll have to check that out on Google Street View for sure. You're definitely making Uzbekistan sound fabulous, and I want to be there. Um, how, are they, how are they dealing with the coronavirus pandemic? Generally, it's been pretty good. Um, Uzbekistan has got a population of 33 million people, but has had fewer than 300 deaths. Um, and the reasons they've been able to do that, first of all, they locked down really, really early. Um, so they locked down in March before they had a single death. Um, so a lot of people thought that was premature. Um, but actually what it meant is that they were able to control every single case that popped up. Um, they closed the borders, they stopped the flights. Anybody who was coming in, uh, for example, returning citizens had to quarantine. So they kept a really, really close eye and monitored everything that was going on. Um, and the other thing is, is culturally, um, it's a society which is very community based. So everybody knows their neighbors and knows exactly what's going on in their neighbors. So I guess sometimes that can be quite frustrating if you're a young person want to go out and do things without your, your neighbours and your parents knowing about it. Um, but in a, a situation like this, it's been very good because people knew exactly what was going on in their community. If anybody was ill, they were able to get them the help. Um, but it also meant that people weren't trying to find loopholes to break the rules and get around the restrictions because they knew that their, their neighbours or their, their families were not only watching them, but also would be adversely affected by what they did. So when the government put rules in place, generally people followed them without uh without protesting i mean that's just crazy coming from someone who lives in america where that is never the case and the same <laughs> in the uk as well i mean the first thing whenever we've got new rules here is people look for excuses and ways they can get around the rules and make an exception for themselves but um i think culturally that's a very different approach to a, a community where you do feel 
yes you're an individual but you're also part of a, a family and a society and a wider group and there is a, a sense of shared responsibility for each other's well-being yeah, that, I mean, that sounds amazing, to be fair. Um, and I wish that the U.S. was a little bit more like that. Um, but so you, you were talking about the culture being quite different than that in Kazakhstan or the, some of the other countries around it. Um, I guess talk to me about why or how different the people are, because it, it, it did come sort of from the same like Soviet era region. Um, so why has Uzbekistan's people why are they different than the others? Does that make sense? Yeah, why, why are the Uzbek people different? So the main reason is going back historically is that in Uzbekistan there were settled communities, whereas in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan the populations were predominantly nomadic. And the kind of society you have if you're always on the move um, is gonna be very, very different um, if you're based on sort of your, your agriculture, you're herding your animals, you're hunting, and you're, you're fighting for territory because it's good hunting ground, that's very, very different to if you're a community who has um, built farms, built cities, and your, your social structure is about trade. Um, because if you're a, a trading, uh, an, an agriculture and trading community, you've got to protect the land that you're on, you've got to engage with other people, you've got to trade, um, and you've got to, to build for the future. You don't have the option next year just to move on to new pastures. Um, you've got to invest in in construction and maintaining what you have. Um, so I think that has had a, a very big influence on Uzbekistan and a number of the cities which are still inhabited in Uzbekistan today go back two or three thousand years or more um, and have been continually inhabited, even if they were historically attacked by Alexander the Great or Genghis Khan. Um, the people who lived there did rebuild their communities and um, generally stayed in, in more or less the same place. The only things which encouraged people to move occasionally were if, for example, a water source dried up or a river changed course, because then the, the fundamental water supply that enabled them to live there was removed. But generally people settled in an area and then stayed there, whatever happened. Okay. And you've sort of touched on a lot of stereotypes, I think, of that, that area. Um, but what would be a stereotype that you'd want to combat in terms of Uzbekistan, the country, or the people that are there? Um, I think the, the stereotype I would want to combat is that it's all very Soviet. Um, because people have this negative idea of the Soviet Union, which isn't, isn't necessarily accurate. And overlooks the the diversity of the people who were within the Soviet Union and also the fact that the Soviet Union ended 30 years ago and so the majority of people particularly in a country like Uzbekistan which is a very young country um, most people were born after the fall of the Soviet Union so it's going to have minimum influence on on the way grew, they grew up um, and what you do see now um, is the Um, the sort of the, the multiculturalism of Uzbekistan that has always been there because of the Silk Road and because of migration during the Soviet period is really flourishing as Uzbekistan is enhancing its, its trading and its diplomatic and its cultural links with other countries. So there are really close relationships with Korea, for example, um, with Japan, with India, to some extent the Middle East and Turkey, and of course with Russia and China as well. So when you go to a city like Tashkent, you will see people from all around the world, you'll find restaurants from all around the world, and you feel that you're part of a, a global community. You're not in a backwater in Central Asia, which is what some people expect to find, but actually you are in the heart of the world and connected with every part of the world. I did not have a huge amount of preconceived notions about Uzbekistan, just because like, I've just never learned really about that part of the world um, in any of my schooling, or like that was never a place that I was you know, that my friends were like, ooh, let's go to Uzbekistan for vacation. But I will say that in my mind, um, it was gonna be desert, a lot of desert, and not so much the mountains that you're talking about. And yeah, I think like the Soviet influence, I bet I is kind of in the back of my mind. Having said that, it is crazy because the Soviet Union was massive 
And even in the US, which is pretty large, uh, there are just so many different cultures and groups of people and everything else. So to think that that whole block uh, was the same kind of people. Yeah, that is a very strange thing. Uh, now that you've explained that, I'm all, duh, guys. Um, we should get over that. <laughs> um, okay, well, so just going to change gears a little bit. Um, what's your favorite travel story? And maybe it's from Uzbekistan or maybe it's not. Um, I love to road trip. And I, I actually quite like breaking down and getting lost. Um, and there've been a number of occasions in Uzbekistan where I've, I've driven out, um, but not so much these days because the roads are, are somewhat better. Um, but sort of 10, 10 years ago or so when the roads were not so good and foreigners were not so familiar, um, and end up in the middle of nowhere, probably somewhere I wasn't intending to go. Everything would be shut. Um, there'd be no apparent place to stay. There'd be no restaurants, but somebody would always appear. Um, and it would usually be somebody's granny um, would sort of come and sort of grab you off the street. And there's always an opportunity to, to go home, to stay with them, to have tea, to have a meal and to, to start a conversation and a friendship. And I, I'm not going to describe to you a specific time when that happened because it's happened so many times. But one of the things I love about Uzbekistan is the fact that there is still so much warm and genuine hospitality. Um, it's not you're invited in because you're a tourist. It's in, you're invited in because you're a guest. Um, and a guest is something which is um, almost sacred in society. And it, it's people's duty and their joy to invite guests into their home and to make them feel welcome. Yeah, um, this is definitely something that I'm hearing a lot uh, as I go through some of these countries as well, um, which I, I doubt that people have in the back of have in their mind as well. Um, they probably think those kinds of things are, are scary situations. So that's really lovely to hear. Um, I also am a big road tripper. So yeah, I'm there. It's, it's a huge contrast with with Europe and I guess to the US where we're always told don't hitchhike don't go out after dark, don't talk to strangers, don't take lifts from strange men. Um, and yet in Uzbekistan, actually, it's pretty safe um, to do those kind of things. And it's pretty common to do those kind of things. Um, if I'm driving my own vehicle, often I'll pick up people who are by the side of the road and it could be um, people's grannies, it could be school kids, it could be um, local officials or businessmen who need to get to the town to pick up something. And there's no expectation of, of payment, but if people are, um, if you're giving somebody a lift, they'll often invite you then to join them for dinner or meet their family, or there'll be some sort of social occasion. Okay. And what's, uh, this is my own ignorance, what's the official language in Uzbekistan? Um, Uzbek is the main language, okay. but because there is, such a, a huge um, number of different ethnic groups in Uzbekistan of which their own language. Um, a lot of people also speak Russian because that's still considered to be the lingua franca between different ethnic groups. Okay. There are other local languages like Tajik, Kazakh, uh, Tata, Karakalpak. <laughs> um, and increasingly the younger generation wants to learn English. Okay. So actually if you're anywhere that's um, remotely touristy or where you encounter school age kids, they're all going to want to practice their English on you and you'll be able to communicate that way. Do you speak a little bit of Russian? I speak some, not as much as I ought to. Okay. All right. Um, or Uzbek. Do you speak Uzbek? I don't speak Uzbek, but I speak enough Russian to, to get around and get food and taxis and read the signposts and the sort of practical, useful things. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, all right. And then if we were in Uzbekistan together, which we should definitely go together and please let's road trip. Um, that sounds amazing, but uh, I will let you answer the question, even though I have my own idea about what we should do. <laughs> um, what would, yeah, what would we go and do in Uzbekistan if we were there? So now it is about 10 o'clock in Uzbekistan in the evening and being in the middle of summer, it's going to have been hot all day. So the place I would want to take you is called Liabi House. And it's um, a man-made reservoir in the old town in Bukhara. And it's basically a, a pool um, surrounded by beautiful trees. And then beyond that, 
gorgeous um, tiled uh, madrasas and other historic buildings. And the reason I love Liabi House is because there are um, sort of quiet tables and chairs under the trees. You can sit there, there's always going to be people drinking tea, um, eating kebabs, uh, playing board games, reading the newspaper. And it's a place to, to go and chill out, but also to people watch. And on a hot day like today, you know 10 o'clock at night, Lavi House is going to be really, really busy. There's going to be lots of people walking through, uh, enjoying the fact that it's a bit cooler now. Some of them will have their sort of their, their finery, their fancy outfits on and be showing off their fashion. There'll be kids running around playing. So it's a great place for us to sit, have a chat, watch the world go by and soak up some authentic local culture. That sounds amazing. Yes, uh, we'll be there. We will do that. Um, and you had also, we had also talked about traditional Uzbek dance as well, um, which maybe you want to explain a little or just talk about a little, and then we can bring, um, we can bring Tara on to do one. I think most people go to Uzbekistan for the, the architecture and the history and the sort of the built environment, but the country's intangible cultural history, uh, intangible cultural heritage is actually just as important. And that includes everything from the, the fashion to the language, to the food, and definitely to the music and dance. And music and dance is a really important part of the performance culture of the country. A lot of it has got very, very ancient roots, which Tara will be able to explain to us in, in much more detail. But people really, really love to um, celebrate with, with music and dance. Whenever there is any kind of uh, festival or family occasion, you can guarantee there will be great food, quite a lot of alcohol, and then music and dance. And everybody takes to the floor, whether they are five years old or 85 years old. Um, the grannies will be out there dancing, the aunties, um, both men and women dance and really get into it. I mean, it's not like in the UK where we might be standing in the back sort of shuffling our feet a bit embarrassed people will be going full out arms legs <laughs> really really enjoying, enjoying. hi sophie <laughs> how are you looking very glamorous i love the ikat oh thanks this is one of my millions of you know i'm a, i'm i'm addicted to ikat so, <laughs> so I, I might as well wear it i have an occasion to wear it <laughs> yeah absolutely um, so yeah, first of all, tell us a little, ba little bit about Uzbek dance, um, and then we would love to see you perform. That would be amazing. Okay, great. Um, yeah, well, uh, you know, the, the dance forms are very much uh, kind of uh, a living performed heritage, so they don't exist underneath uh the the confines of like it's not like oh it's traditional so therefore it's static and frozen in time under a little museum box it's you know the the movements um change and develop over time because they're on different body types to people with different anatomy and then of course it's it's very much evocative very diverse because it's evocative of the environments that they're born from so they'll just as in you know ballet we think of it as a genreless style but actually if you look at the set the flora and the fauna is actually from eastern europe and they have hunters and they have uh woodcutters so the same thing in uzbekistan though they would have maybe an osh maker so the character in the dance would be someone making pilaf or uh there's a dance about the about bread there's there's death dances there's birth dances there's dances um for different seasonal holidays so no ruse the first day of uh spring which is their new year um so there's you know everyone dances old young women, men, uh, that's, I think, something that maybe people would be surprised uh, if they didn't have any reference to Central Asia as a Muslim majority country and um, as a place maybe you just wouldn't have a reference to. Uh, but yes, everyone dances and there's a lot of dancing going on. And I think it's, <laughs> it is really uh, a vibrant part of how people express themselves at any social gathering. It's almost impossible not to see dance. Um, and so I'll just show you a few harikat. Harikat is, uh, means gestures or movements um, that represent different things. So, okay. for example, um, this is, I'm in a chair, probably shouldn't be in a chair to be showing you these. I'll try. Let's see here. Um, 
So this is would be a tree, so like a cypress tree. Um, eyes. Um, there's also um, Sharushara. Sharushara means waterfall. So the Sharushara, um, it's like this movement here. Um, and then they also have all these kind of undulating, undulating movements. And from the Zoroastrian period, pre-Islamic period, there's a lot of um, references to the four elements, earth, water, air, fire. So they'll be um, showing the fire. They'll be showing clearing the spirits, clearing the space from um, bad spirits. Uh, and then each style, so there's three schools of dance, um, from Bukhara to Khiva to the Khorezmi style, which is um, quite quite virtuosic and can get quite wild, actually. The ladies really, it's a style where you'll actually see the ladies, you know, actually a little bit shaking the chest and the chest is covered with gold ornaments um, and doing very acrobatic um, knee spins and back bends backwards. Uh, so it can get quite, quite wild. <laughs> um, and then the Fergana style, which is from the valley. So again, evocative kind of as a living link to place outside of time and space. Um, you can really, if the more you look at the different movement qualities, you can see how the Fergana is softer landscapes, flowing rivers. And so the style is very airy and soft and floaty. Okay. Um, so yeah, and I thought I would maybe teach, invite you guys to to join along. Yes. <laughs> with a few. I, few I think it's, uh, before we do that, it's interesting because I've seen these different uh, dance moves in the past, but I did not know yes. that they had meaning, like a literal meaning, like the waterfall one or the tree or whatnot. So that's pretty yeah. interesting to now. Now when I see those dances, it's going to mean something very different. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think and even I don't, I, I speak only maybe, I don't know, 50 words in Uzbek. I'm much better in Tajik. Um, but, you know, there's so much just to be observed through, through nonverbal communication. It is a really effective way of storytelling and bearing witness to the culture and, and, um, and seeing it even outside of its context, you can pick up so much from the environment that it was created in. Mm -hmm. And there's, of course, uh, pure dance too, which is abstract pure dance um, as well. But there's also the Sheshmakam tradition, which is a thousand year old tradition or more. Shesh meaning six and Makam is the musical nodes. Um, and so that tradition, they accompany with poetry. So even more linear, like you were saying, it, it actually is even more linear in the fact that it's, it's following the, the prose, it's following the lines of this Sufi poetry that's very ancient um, from famous, you know, Hafez, Rumi, all of these, um, Navoyi, all the famous poets that are known from Central Asia. So That's yeah, amazing. yeah, I'm a poet myself. So now I'm like, oh, I gotta look at into all of this stuff. Uh, oh I yeah, had no and idea existed. That's amazing. Yes, and there's lots of actually Zebunisa. There's several um, female poets who are quite revered, and their poetry has been choreographed on and is very well known by the Uzbek public. That um, they know these these lines by heart, even maybe the gestures that go with it by heart. So okay, yeah, nice. All right. So, yeah, so I thought I would show you some of, let's see, I think we'll do a little bit of from the Fergana style, and then we'll do a little bit from the Khorezmi style. So I've just put, and I've, I have got given you guys, <laughs> I picked out some songs that are more, um, yeah, they're from the pop genre. So it's what you would hear at a wedding. It's what you would hear in someone's home, what you'd hear probably walking by a corner shop. I'm sure Sophie's heard many, <laughs> many of these. Um, and so the, for the Khorezmi, for example, so um, that style, like I said, is very, it can get very athletic. Um, I personally love that style just because I am quite flexible and I love, I love being able to do all of these very precise and technical things, but it's also, you know, done um, by, you know, the, the public is all, general public is also doing these styles as well, not as a super technique style, but um, so the movements will give you a few movements. <laughs> 
So you want to try to push the middle of your forearm up and let the hand just drag beyond, behind. So you're pushing up like that. And as you push from your wrist, you're letting your, your hand kind of do this little quivering, quivering movement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the more you push, the more tension, the more you'll get that little. And this is, this is a movement of joyfulness. Yeah. Well, my left hand, I don't do very well. <laughs> the left doesn't work like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, it's, it's, we're just, just starting. Yeah. So another one. Um, so they do, if you put your both your hands over your head, so you're gonna flop from, it's a lot of wrist articulation. So we're doing flop and flop. And now we're flopping around. The right comes back again and the left comes back again. <laughs> yeah, one, two, three, four. Again, one, two, three, four. Nice. Um, so there's also a legend that the one of the fav the most favored uh, courtesans from the court of the emir uh, was injured, and the emir asked her to dance. He wanted her to perform inside inside the court, and she had broken her leg. So she came out and danced with a broken leg, and the other the other dancers were quite jealous because they wanted the patronage from the emir. So the, there's the legend that this style of the Khorezmi style, uh, which they call lesgi, uh, developed with this lilting movement because they all, all the other dancers were mirroring her. They were trying to copy this, this broken leg dancer. So, so um, there's some movements where you're dancing with your your foot. the 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 movement always goes to the side. Yeah. So you have these these quivering hands, but you're you're moving your body from side to side as if you had a broken a broken leg. And the same thing. This is the fire. So we're referencing the elements. Also referencing the animals that are in the environment, so it's quite arid, um, desert-like. So the jerboa, which is the long-legged, uh, I think he's the mouse. Um, so with the two hands on top, they, they, they mimic the jerboa. <laughs> they mimic the camel. Um, there's, so there's many, and there's also the snake. Um, having these movements like that. So there's, and this one also can be like the snake. So maybe again, we'll try a few of these movements together with some Khorezmi pop music. Okay. So this is, uh, it has the differences because it has the drum set. So it has the boom box kind of a um, little more, a little more pop version, but it still has the melodies that are um, traditional to the Khorezmi style. It's interesting because um, also sorry. In, oh, sorry. What were you saying? In like Caribbean and Jamaican dance as well, um, mm -hmm. or like a dance hall, they also have a limp style move, ah. um, where it's like usually it's straight leg though, and they're like kind of walking with a straight leg, like their leg is in a cast. Yeah. So I wonder where that comes from. That's really interesting. It is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I wonder, I mean, yeah, because they say a lot of, a lot of dancers, you know, you, you pick up, you, you watch each other and you, I wonder how it was developed. I don't know. Yeah. So, okay, here we go. And we'll start with our hands up overhead and right. Beating our 
repeating our wrists together as we're making this, this movement. Just shake from the wrist, yeah. Can you lift your ball up. One, two, three, one, two, three, with a beat. <laughs> Um, with a limping leg. And one, two, three, three. I don't I have I don't have that with me I brought a few things um, so this is the so I'm wearing adras which is a cotton ikat textile which is famous for um, from Central Asia and all the ladies you'll see them wearing it any any festive occasion or even every day sometimes they'll wear it and then this one is atlas Khan atlas which is like the king Khan is king, so like the king atlas, and it's made out of silk, and it's woven, hand dyed and woven, and all these kind of very wild, but very vibrant, brilliantly vibrant colors. So the dancers will wear, um, for the for the Khorezmi Lesgi style, wouldn't wear atlas. They would wear, uh, I don't have it with me, but anyways, they would wear a hat, kind of like this. And then they'd have all these teeny tiny, teeny tiny little right. um, embellishments hanging down into their face, mm -hmm. and then completely covered in their chest with with ornamentation here as well. So um, it's a it's a fun style. <laughs> I what one other question? What? Yeah. Is, why so much shaking in the hands and wrists? That's a good question, and I don't actually have the answer to it. I I mean I've even done anthropological field research where we would go and ask people in different villages, dancers particularly, why do you dance? What does this mean? So not, not that uh, people have an awareness of what the movement that looks familiar to them is, but um, I've never had it verbalized why, for the pure dance moments, why, why specifically, um, you know, like, you know, kind of iconically Central Asian or Uzbek that there's that that quivering. I've never had it broken down to me. Um, but yes, it is absolutely distinctively um, a feature of, of, of the style of dance from Uzbekistan for sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and I have, oh yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I thought I have one more little song that's completely much softer than that um, if we want to do a little more dancing, but up to you. <laughs> okay. Um, well, yeah. Sophie, it's, uh, do you still have time? Because I'm down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, that's fine. Let's do it. Okay. One more. One more to finish it off. <laughs> so this one's a little bit softer, and I'm just going to give you a few little moves to survive at your next Uzbek wedding when you're out in Central Asia or the next time a lady pulls you up and grabs you, you will be fully prepared. <laughs> um, not that you weren't already, but just a few more um, movements in your arsenal. So um, we're gonna go side sweeping. This one's a more sweeping, softer movement. Side and out, nice. And side and out, good, side and out, and side, and out, great. And then we're gonna step forward, 
And we're gonna bend at the wrist. So we do one, two, three, four. Good. And then we're gonna clap. <laughs> so, yeah. Surprise. And we do our head. That one's a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> one, two, and or you could do one, two, three, four. Nice. Yeah. So one, two, three, four, five front and side front to the down one two three four snap up snap and up and head head and we'll go around two three four five six seven eight shoulder 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 good other side shoulder shoulder shoulder, shoulder, and as you know, we always finish with salam and our hand to our heart, which is always the way you greet someone in Central Asia, in Uzbekistan, and that's usually how all the dancing ends. <laughs> okay, here we go. Last dance for the win. Ah? Now I do feel way more prepared because I would yeah. not have danced like that should any of anybody hold me up. <laughs> you, pick, so. you both picked it up super fast, so that's, that's cool. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, to both of you, Sophie, for telling me a little bit about Uzbekistan and Tara for dancing. Um, I think that's, that's it. So thanks so much. And we'll definitely stay in contact so that one day we can all be in Uzbekistan together. Yes, and hopefully you'll be there next summer. Yes, please. Yeah, I hope. I hope. If the coronavirus can just go away now, that would be wonderful. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Take care. Okay. Thank you so much, Sophie. Bye, Tara. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.